Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. As always, it is Nick here, back with your daily crypto news and analysis. And today we're going to be talking about Quant Network, aka Q&T, so let's just dive in. And let's start off with this tweet here from Unusual Whales. Uh, we do see just in the six biggest U.S. banks are expected to set aside nearly $5 billion in the third quarter to cover future loan losses. Wall Street analyst said to Reuters, as the lenders brace for a potential global recession, this is very interesting. So um, I've been talking to you guys on this channel for a while about a recession growing, a global reset growing, and everything happening rapidly around CBDC adoption and innovation. Now, why have we been talking about this for a while? Well, it's simply because I do believe that CBDCs are going to be the global reset around the financial market. Now, with that in mind, um, a lot of people have been centered on a few things, right? Uh, first off, the biggest one that I have focused on is regulations. Now, regulations are going to be the key that unlocks crypto adoption. I actually think that this is what's going to streamline the adoption cycle of crypto. And I think that this is also what's going to ignite after we do see the full on reset. Um, a lot of things are going to align perfectly to usher in the reset around the financial system. Uh, really kind of playing into crypto as well, taking over. And we do see a sound regulatory approach for digital assets. And it's funny, right? Because this is from Gilbert Verdian himself. We do see new roles like the UK's financial services and markets bill and the EU's crypto assets regulation. Mika should be welcomed, argues Quant's founder and CEO Gilbert Verdian. Um, over the last five years, investment in cryptocurrency increased from $100 billion to market cap of $3 trillion in November of 2021. Uh, during that time, crypto went mainstream. And I would argue that it actually hasn't. Um, I think that it started to kind of trickle into the retail sector in terms of, you know, sort of going mainstream, but it really hasn't gotten there yet. Um, I think that we we still have a long way to go until it goes fully mainstream. Uh, but we have seen a ton of adoption. We have seen a ton of major, um, how should I say, advertising and marketing around crypto. Um, but we also do see down here that on an institutional level, many financial services organizations began to adopt digital assets as a new way to transform financial instruments, access new markets, and unlock illiquid assets. However, there was a dark side. Many people, some of whom could least afford it, were ill-educated on the risk, volatility, and stability of these assets. And I do agree that we do need you know, full-on regulations. Um, I think that we do still need a lot more to kind of be ushered in around regulations. I still think that we need a little bit more of an insight on how, you know, proper regulations could play into, um, you know, crypto adoption, things like that. But I've also talked about on this channel that we need to have a regulatory approach that continues to allow crypto to grow and expand um, and have innovation continue to prosper instead of stifling it, um, which, you know, the wrong sort of uh, regula regulatory approach could ultimately kill crypto and stifle innovation fully. But I will say that I think that this is going to be the biggest thing that starts to fire is regulations. I think that regulations are going to unlock the floodgates. We're going to see massive institutions, major financial institutions just kind of jumping into crypto, diving headfirst. We're going to see a ton of banking clients and you know major players jumping into crypto. And uh, I also think that when we look at crypto, it's going to be the new you know, asset class that takes over. Um, a lot of people, including Kevin O'Leary, has said that it's going to be the 12th sector of the S&P 500. Is that going to be the case? Who knows? Um, but we've talked about how tokenization could actually flood into um, equities and essentially have the entire stock market fully tokenized, which I think is also a possibility in the future. But I really do think that the overall great reset is happening around the financial system. I think that central bankers are trying to collapse the system. And um, I think that this is going to usher in CBDCs. And in fact, we did see at CBOs, CBDCs being spotlighted. CBDCs will take some time. Central banks don't move quickly, but look at China. It is happening. Uh, stable coins will be regulated, but they're different to CBDCs. They're inherently global. Tokenized deposits may you know, be where stable coins go. And this was a full on discussions on CBDCs in general. Um, you know, it's definitely going to be a very interesting time frame. I think that's going to start with regulations and then it's going to unfold rapidly. And we do see stable coins need to be re uh, regulated and they will be. Uh, there's no way law enforcement allows people to move money across borders and, no and not check it. CBDCs and tokenized deposits can coexist to some extent. Uh, the CBDCs can be a clearing mechanism.
Uh, I'm more positive about timeframes for CBDCs. As we speak, the Euro system is considering the launch of two CBDCs, retail and wholesale. It may move more quickly than we might expect. In Europe, there is an appetite for it. And I actually think that this, like I said, is going to happen um, very fast. And we do see the panel concludes that the main change over the next 12 months will come from regulation. I do believe that in the next year, we will see full on regulatory uh, frameworks and clarity happen around crypto and digital assets. In five years, you'll see a lot more existing assets tokenized alongside with new assets like real estate or private placements. You know, we do see digital value is something that people want. And I would argue, and I know that this is going to be a very broad statement, um, but I'm actually a little bit concerned about selling crypto into fiat at this time. Um, and I've I've said this many times, like, listen, I'm always going to take profits. I'm always going to secure profits because at the end of the day, if you don't take profits, this market will. Um, but I will say it is very important to understand that fiat itself is becoming um, a means of financial ruin. What do I mean by that? Well, the US dollar is going to lose its value. We've seen currencies around the world lose its value extremely fast. The UK is a perfect example of this. I focused on CBDCs because I believe that digitally, um, a lot of these major tokens that we do hold like QNT, XRP, um, Algorand, HBAR, etc. These are going to continue to grow. Yes, during bear markets, we will see their value collapse, but how long will we have bull and bear markets around crypto? You know, when when does a utility-driven market take over and these tokens continue to be stable and have a very solid increase in value continuously? Because utility is going to be the biggest change in scenery around this entire market. The entire landscape is going to change once we do see regulatory clarity come into the space and then we'll see mass adoption come from the mass institutional grade area and uh, financial institutions utilizing these you know, digital tools uh, to not only transact, but also tokenize and move funds. I mean, everything will be systemically you know, revolutionized. Um, and this is the fourth industrial revolution that we do speak about on a daily basis on this channel. And uh, talking about things happening, SWIFT. So a lot of people have been speculating that Quant will be, uh, you know, not only fully disrupting the SWIFT system, but also connecting the SWIFT system. We do see over here from Quantany over on uh, Twitter, industry underscore Q, SWIFT, the European Commission and the United Nations are part of the ISO TC307 created by Quant CEO, blockchain standardization international level. Uh, we do see the European Commission, Society for World uh, Wide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, aka SWIFT. And then we also do see down here, uh, UNECE, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. This is very interesting. Um, I do think that they're going to be a part of the blockchain and DLT sort of, uh, you know, revolution. And I think that this is going to be very exciting. And we do see down here, here's uh, ISO TC307 talking about DLT and DLT adoption itself. You do see a lot of things happening within this entire standardization. So this is talking about terminology, use cases, privacy and personally identifiable information protection considerations, security, sorry, security management of digital asset custodians, uh, legally binding smart contracts, security risk, threats and vulnerabilities, overview of identity management using blockchain and DLTs, taxonomy and ontology, guidelines for governance, reference architecture, and then down here we do see the overview of and interactions between smart contracts and DLT systems is published already ready and uh, we do see on the next slide over here sorry uh, I right clicked the blockchain centers landscape and we do see super uh, national and industry organizations important global organi organizations relevant to blockchain standards include ISO in particular ISO TC 307 and uh, this is very interesting shaping Europe's digital future the blockchain standards landscape I believe at the end of the day and I, I know that this is going to be a broad statement it's not a 100% true statement. This is more so speculation and also a little bit of a conspiracy theory. But my theory on quant is that it's going to lay the framework core foundation under everything. We're talking about Europe. We're talking about the United States. We're talking about everything. It is going to be the core underlying foundation for the entire landscape of the digital future economy. The entire 
global financial system is moving towards a digital future. And I believe that quant is going to be the connector between it all. We actually do see over here from just a tech guy, this is talking about Swift again. Listen, do we have full on 100% confirmation that quant will connect, you know, Swift? Not exactly, but there's a ton of connections here to Swift. Financial messaging system Swift claims to have solved the challenge of interoperability and cross border transactions in a major step towards unlocking the potential of the digital future. And this is talking about CBDCs and tokenized assets um, and how they could essentially move seamlessly on existing financial infrastructures. We do see a collaboration with Capgemini. Swift achieved CBDC to CBDC transactions between DLT based on Quorum and Corda technologies, as well as fiat to CBDC flows between these networks and a real-time growth settlement system, aka the RTGS. And uh, we do see over here, the SWIFT solution, CBDC A to CBDC B. We do see the um, ISO 20022 bridge here, the connector gateway on both sides. And uh, we do see over here, here's the DLT gateway interoperability MIT. And uh, this is DLT gateways. This is, of course, the gateway to gateway. This is through Overledger, by the way, if you guys were not aware. Um, very similar approach, very, very similar uh, diagram as well. Um, and then we do see down here, uh, DLT gateways allow interoperability between those organizations using any DLT they want. There's no need for an intermediary network. There's no need for, uh, or sorry, to, for both parties to use the same software uh, packets such as Hyperledger Cactus, Weaver, D DAML, Settle, Firefly, and YUI. Um, and then down here we do see Digital Pound Foundation. Um, of course, this is from June 9th on uh, the 23rd of June, Digital Pound Foundation originating member uh, Yana Pache uh, will be speaking alongside representatives from the Payments Association, SWIFT, HSBC, Capgemini, Standard Chartered, uh, Synonyx, and uh, Capronasia, I hope that I'm saying that name right, to talk about CBDCs on a global scale. And of course, here are those major names. We do know that with the Digital Pound Foundation, also has uh, Quant directly tied to it. I'm not saying that, hey, this is full on confirmation. This is not 100%, but I'm just saying if this is the case, this is Quant's gateway, literally their gateway, to 11,000 plus financial institutions. This would be very, very substantial. I think that this will also be very interesting to see if this does go fully live, if we have full on confirmation of this. This would probably be the biggest, if not the largest ever um, announcement from Quant because again, this would be a huge, huge change of scenery for Quant. But of course, we do know that Swift recently did actually announce the uh, partnership with Chainlink. We don't know what's going to happen with that, but it's not the same exact thing as, you know, Quant. Like this is not like when we look at what Chainlink is doing compared to what Quant is doing in terms of interoperability, it is night and day differences. We've talked about this. We've talked about the, um, concerns around Chainlink versus Quant. Um, there is a full-on study from, I think it was the IMF, or it might have been the World Economic Forum, uh, but they talked about gateways versus oracles and how gateways are essentially the, the, the chosen one in terms of security. And I even think that that's why we are seeing Swift kind of go through, you know, a gateway here, which at the end of the day, if we're talking about a gateway solution, I mean, what better way to utilize Overledger than it is to utilize Overledger for something like this? This would be a huge confirmation. Again, it's speculation, but we know at the end of the day that interoperability is the solution to be clear. And we do see, but as far as I know, there are not yet 100% secured interoperability protocols. Too often the bridges act as open bridges. It still needs to be developed. And this is talking about how those uh, bridges are, and by the way, these are technically, if you will, if you want to talk about bridges, it's more so like oracles as well. Like oracles are essentially bridges at the end of the day, and they're not fully secure. They're not the highest grade security. A gateway is the extreme secure way of connecting things because when you have a gateway, you're cutting out the middleman. Hence why when you see in this, connect, in this uh, connectivity here with the connector uh, gateway, there's no middleman there. You're cutting that out fully. And I even think that, was it in this diagram or I think it was maybe in this one over here. So here's the state transfer protocol in a connector or if you will, a bridge or Oracle, you'll have a middleman uh, or an intermediary, if you will, um, that connects the, the system. So that middleman or that intermediary, if you want to call it, would which would probably be the better terminology for it, um, could easily be hacked or there's just 
there's key areas that could easily have um, security breaches within it, which causes a lot of you know concerns and problems to arise, which we've seen that be the case in a lot of instances. So having that API gateway would be key. And also this statement here from CBOS actually proves the fact that Quant is still sort of a hidden secret in terms of interoperability. There's not a lot of exposure here. So we are still very early in on what Quant is doing. Just so anybody out there who is wondering, am I still early on Quant? You 100% are. So with that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys did, definitely leave a like, subscribe to notifications on because of more free content. You guys are more than welcome to follow me on Twitter and join the free Discord down in the description below. As always, up to you all. Have a beautiful day, beautiful night, wherever you guys are in this beautiful world. This has been Nick. Peace out, guys.